Yeah, welcome back to The Breakfast on PLOS TV Africa. There's a new report which ranks Nigeria as the third worst governed country in the world. The country ranked 102 out of 104 countries in the Chanda Government Index, only ahead of Zimbabwe and Venezuela. The index ranks countries using indices like leadership and foresight, laws and policies, strong institutions, global influence and reputation, financial stewardship, attractive marketplace, and helping people rise. Two public analysts uh, joining us this morning, Osea Aneni is in Abuja, and Nick Aguile is joining us from the UK. Good morning, gentlemen. Thanks for joining us. Thanks for having us. Good morning. All right. I want Good to morning. begin. Thank you very much. Yes. I, I want to begin with the basics. 104 countries were ranked for effectiveness and you know cap capability. Nigeria scored 102. We know that in the next few hours, next few days, if, you know, the government authorities would begin to release press statements, you know, questioning these figures and basically debunking them, saying, you know, it's not true. It doesn't represent realities on ground like we've seen, you know, in time past. But do we have evidence that questions this index? I think let's have Osea Neni speak on that. Okay. Um, yes. Thank you, guys. So, so the thing with these types of, of measures are that they are largely independent. They are largely done by, you know, world-renowned think tanks. They are largely populated by data from credible institutions. Um, and most importantly, they are not targeted at Nigeria. So it's not an index that was that set out to make Nigeria look bad. Um, so you have your Transparency International Index, you have your Global Insecurity Index, etc. Et and you know, if, if the Nigerian government were to take this, this in Okay, um, seems we're having issues uh, connecting with uh, Oseaneni. Uh, Nick Agule, can you hear us? Oh, we may have lost both of them now. Okay, this is why we're ranked so poorly. <laughs> <laughs> All right. We, I we'll didn't see reconnect. telecoms on that list, but... <laughs> we need, we're going to reconnect with our guests this morning, you know, and keep the conversation going. Why did we score so poorly? And I like one thing that Osea Neni said. Mm -hmm. This wasn't targeting Nigeria. You know, it, it basically is ranking countries across the world. So it is not a, um, you know, report that is sponsored by the opposition or sponsored by anybody. To make Nigeria look bad, yeah, it basically has it rated, uh, yeah, you know, countries across the world. And this is how we fared. Um, there's also, you know, Are you sure it wasn't details. sponsored, though? No, it wasn't. Are you, are you sure sponsored. it wasn't, you know, um, a, a, you know a plot of the opposition party? Uh, no, it wasn't. You know, to target the there's, party. Um, there's, you know, part of, you know, the report, you know, I read through it yesterday um, that mentioned certain things, you know, with regards to corruption and the likes. Oh, Sanani, welcome back. All right. Can you hear us? I can hear you. Can Fantastic. You hear me? Yes, please, can. please continue. Okay. So yes, it's not. Um, for, it's fortunately or unfortunately, it's not a PDP plot. Uh, we're not um, a <laughs> member of this Chandler government. <laughs> um, in, but interestingly enough, there is a Nigerian on the board. I think um, Mr. Okirele, uh, he's from the World Bank, um, and, and this this index does give insight into the problems we are facing as a country. Uh, we know we have education problems, for instance, which is one of the helping people rise uh, issues. We know we have corruption. We know we have insecurity issues. I think recently we came up as the, the country with the largest unelectrified un population in the world. We're one of the mo most insecure. When you talk about trade and government ability to manage the economy, we have one of the largest debt overhangs we've ever had in this country right now. We struggled with after. Um, how do you um, how do you encourage trade when you, for instance, we do things like border closure? Um, so it's it's it's. I think it should be a pointer to the government. Um, the things were spelled out very clearly, and they tell us where we're failing. Uh, any serious government would look at this as a roadmap to progress and pro prosperity okay. instead of a, an opposition party um, manifesto. All right, let's get your perspective, Mr. Nika Julie. Um, what do you think regarding, you know, the, the, the authenticity of this index? Hey, thank, you, thank you very much. Um, before I say anything, I would like to say that as Nigerians, we should not be discouraged by the statements that are issued by the government 
uh, because uh, all over the world, uh, people who are employed to launder the image of the government, they do their job by issuing press statements, defending government policies. It's their daily bread. So that is going to happen. What we need to do as Nigerians is when a report such as this is being released and the government counters it, we, we need to look at empirical evidence. We are Nigerians. We live in Nigeria. You know, are we safe? Can we feed? Do we have infrastructure to go about? Are our schools well maintained and strong? If we feel sick, do we have public health institutions we can approach? You know, if the answers to these things are negative, then we, we should just know that uh, this report is not meant to run us down as a people or as a nation, but it's just saying the obvious. And if government issues a statement to debunk it and say it's not true, that this is some sort of international conspiracy against us, we should be able to reject that because it's not as if uh, we are not living with these realities. We are indeed living and experiencing these issues. All right. And, and let, me, let me just expand a bit to say that if you look at this ranking, there is one of the criteria that says robust laws and policies. If you see the countries that are ranked top, the Finland, mm -hmm. you will see the percentage of that is very high. And that is Nigeria's singular problem. Nigeria is a country that is set for stardom. Mm. Set for All stardom. Right. Um, seems you've lost uh, Nick again. I'm not sure what's going on. Um, Osanene, are you there? Can you hear us? Oh, uh, I guess we've lost both, you know, but I'm, I'm going to bring in Osa Neni when we come back. Um, you know, of course, the next question goes to him. You know, it's still with regards to the report and uh, the indices that were used to create the report. You know, something that it says there about massive and widespread corruption uh, that it says, you know, uh, um, you know, is evident in every sphere of government in Nigeria, including the judiciary and security agencies um, and all of that. Um, so I would like that we look closer at that because the uh, Nigerian government has always, <coughs> and the Minister of Information has always uh, spoken about how well we've done with our fight against corruption. Um, and uh, of course, uh, you know, the number of times and the amount of money that we've been able to recover from um, 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 politicians and people who have stolen Nigeria's money. I remember the EFCC chairman also uh, made mention of billions and billions of naira. Osa Aneni, uh, we'll come back to you. Nick Agule, apologies for that. I'm not sure what's going on with the network this morning. But let's go back to Osea Neni. Uh, one of the things, if you read from the report, it states there, massive, widespread, and pervasive corruption affected all levels of government, including <coughs> the judiciary and security services. Then I want to read a response to um, Transparency International's report in January uh, from um, Minister of Information, Lai Mohammed. It says here that uh, the Minister of Information assured that the country's, uh, the country's uh, anti-corruption agenda which has placed great emphasis on corruption prevention measures and building of integrity uh, systems, remains on course. It said the implementation of the various reforms, especially in the ease of doing business, is expected to yield positive outcomes in the country's per perception index and other relevant assessments in the next 12 to 24 months. So, um, Ose, I, I, do you think that, you know, these institutions and these um, establishments are, are being unfair to Nigeria, seeing how hard we've worked um, in the fight against corruption and seeing, you know, the effort that the Nigerian government has put to, you know, put us in a better place with regards to corruption? Um, the answer to that is, is quite simple. Um, you cannot rule by propaganda. Uh, we were in this country when the former anti-corruption czar, uh, Magu, was apprehended by this government and charged for corruption um, activities you know so if, if if this government is even questioning their own leadership then how how then do they do they query these types of of data and, and the, the problem is that you know again i say you cannot rule by propaganda the rest of the world is looking at these measures and are acting so you see companies taking businesses away from nigeria 
and moving to other sub-Saharan Africa. Now, I'm not talking about continent-wide. I'm not talking about South Africa or Kenya. I'm talking about our near abroad. So you see countries moving to Ghana. Uh, recently, there was a big uh, furore when Twitter decided to move to Ghana. And they, they listed the, almost the same things that this index listed about transparency, about personal rights, about uh, respect for, the, for law and order. When, for instance, you, know, you, you beam out to the world and assault on the judiciary, I, remember, I don't know if you recall when the DSS yes. went in the middle of the night to break down the doors of uh, judges, or when you remove your, your, um, your chief justice of Nigeria in the way we did just before the 2019 elections and replace him with what many analysts have called uh, a patsy or a stooge, you, you start to, to weaken trust not just in your judiciary, but in, in the very essence and structures of what holds the nation up. And I, I, would, I would seriously suggest that rather than, than look at this as just an attack on government, analysts within government sit down and look at this, this information and try to address every single one. Okay. And it's very concerning that, for instance, even with all the insecurity in Mali, um, the terrorist uh, issues um, these guys are having in Mozambique, the recent, um, um, I'll call it, chain in government in, in Chad, we are third from bottom. We are only above Zimbabwe, which is literally a failed state, and Venezuela. It, it's a problem. We, we aren't competing with the rest of sub-Saharan Africa, not to talk about the rest of the world. And with the size of our population, it should concern every single person who is, who is truly interested in the progress of Nigeria. If, there is any, if there's any positive, it's that you know, we have been on the path of progress before. I recall in 2013 or so, Nigeria was one of the world's fastest growing economies, where the largest economy. All right. Um, well, back to it again. Um, of course, uh, we of course we struggled to have this conversation this morning, but we will uh, be we will succeed. Yes, eventually. We we'll apologise for for the network yes. fluctuation. We we'll definitely will get back to our guests and get you know all the insights that they have to offer. And really, with this conversation, I would like us to begin to you know peek at the the you know single points that they've mentioned. They they said that they they use thirty four indices that they organized into seven pillars. They talked about leadership and policies, they talked about robust laws, they yeah. talked about you know, security, helping people rise. I'd like us to begin to take a look at these indices one after the other and really see, as a country, where do we stand you know, and be honest with ourselves. Let's have you know, very honest conversations regarding this. And eventually, you know, towards the end of the conversation, ask what is the, you know, the likes of Singapore, of Switzerland, of Finland, you know, doing much, much better than us that we can learn from, and what's you know what's stopping us really oh, well, from um, emulating you know the the, the the facts and the policies that have been put to work in those countries. Well, you know, you might be going too far. You might just reach out to Ghana, um, Switzerland, and, and Finland, or you know, a, a world apart from us. Um, you know, but it, it's really about institutions. You know, and one of the things that I always ask. And I've always mentioned, um, even in previous interviews, is when a government comes into power, when this current government came into power, were they um, underprepared or were they overwhelmed with, you know, Nigeria's issues? Um, th there was mention of fixing Nigeria's institutions back then. How much stronger are our institutions today? Institutions that should fight corruption, institutions that should protect Nigerians, institutions that should ensure that Nigerians um, get a very, very uh, robust social welfare package um, at all times. One of the things that was mentioned, and I, I think I'm going to go into that next, was the COVID-19 pandemic mm -hmm. and how our institutions failed Nigerians uh, during the pandemic. It's, it's one of the things that I believe did a lot of damage to us um, uh, you know, with this report. Um, how well are our institutions uh, being fixed? Uh, we have, you know, in the last couple of days discussed a minister who, um, you know, was apparently forgiven by the presidency, you know, whereas we should have a presidency as an institution, not as a person, not as a Garba Shehu or Femi Edition or President Muhammad Bari. The presidency should be an institution that should have its standards and should have, um, you know, ways with which it, it functions. So these are some of the things that we uh, completely lack. Um, as a nation, and it's it's sad. You know, I started this, the show this morning talking about how sad you know our reality truly is, and there's really not much of propaganda that can change what that you know not reality is because it stares us in the face. 
You know, and you, you can't avoid it. There's, there's some good things that you can point out and say, yes, these things are working. The trains, for example, there are people who can now travel by train, even if, yes, it's still risky security-wise, but at least those things, you know, are, 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 in, um, are in the works and they, they are in motion somehow, some way. Um, so you can point that out and say, yes, you know, at least give them that, that they've, they've made that happen. But aside that, um, where are we as a nation? Do we still have the guts to call ourselves a giant of Africa in any way um, um, whatsoever? Oh. Well, so, Aneni, uh, welcome back. We completely apologize. Um, I know this isn't how we planned uh, to have this conversation. But welcome back. I, I, I want you to speak on the uh, another part of the report. It says the CGGI explained that the ranking came during the COVID-19 pandemic, which exposed the strengths and weaknesses in institutions, laws, and um, leadership in countries as governance decides the success of these countries. So I, I want you to speak on how we handled the period of the COVID-19 pandemic and the institutions that we had in Nigeria, um, you know, to protect and of course to ensure uh, a, 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 a life for Nigerians. How embarrassing was our COVID-19 period? So I, I think the COVID-19 pandemic kind of, sort of tested all government structures uh, all across the world. And, you know, we need to remember that leadership, you know, comes to the fore when there are problems, not when everything is, is, is fine. So the COVID-19, I don't think, should be an excuse. What happened, for instance, in India and in the UK and in America, you saw even though these were developed or, or almost developed nations, they struggled as well. In Nigeria, I think we have just been lucky that it hasn't been as, as devastating health-wise for us. But it has clearly exposed our inability to respond to nationwide crisis. If you have a, a flood or some other natural disaster or, some, or something like Ebola, for instance, if it comes back now, I don't know whether we'll be ready for it. And it goes back, I think, to maybe just a, a lack of trust in government and in leadership to provide solutions for us. The videos that we saw of people climbing warehouses, trying to get to hoarded boxes of indomie and rice still traumatized me to this day. And, I, and, I, and I, again, I pray that the government looks at this report as a wake-up call. People have lost trust in the judiciary. People have lost trust in the armed forces and the police. People do not believe that this government economic policies will lift them out of poverty. And I hope truly that the government looks at this, every single of the 34 ind indicators, and starts to use it as a roadmap to progress and prosperity. Mm. All right. Uh, Mr. Nika Duril, I want to bring you in again. Are you there with us? Yes, I can hear you. All right. So when I read this channel report, I saw, you know, something very important they, that, that they mentioned. And they said that the strongest correlation to good governance, you know, according to their findings, was, you know, the anti-corruption fight. But we have a government, you know, day in, day out that publicizes reports of just how many people they have arrested, you know, how much they're doing regarding anti-corruption. So... How then do we, you know, marry these two data we're seeing here, seeing that was scored so low, but, you know, the media reports we see every day from the EFCC and other anti-corruption agencies, you know, seems like they're making progress. The, the government can always issue reports and talk about the progress that is being made. But as Nigerians, we have to look at empirical evidence. We're living in the country, we're seeing around us. We know that people who hit that were jobless, had nothing to do, and they uh, 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 take political office, and then suddenly they come upon a stupendous wealth overnight. And, and these people are not being held to account. So any notion by the government that the anti-corruption war is being executed is it, it, not it's not enough that's what i would say it's not adequate because if it were then we wouldn't be having uh, this spate of uh, uh, corruption all over the place why do we know there's corruption every year 
governments at all levels, federal, state, and local governments, they budget, they make budgets. And these budgets cover all the facets of the human development indices, education, healthcare, infrastructure, and all of that. But we don't see these things improving. So if there is budget for roads, and we are not seeing roads improving, there's budget for water, and we are not getting packed one water into our homes, there's budget for education, but we see public schools are not getting better. Then what is the result? The simple result is that the budget is going somewhere else. If the budget was going to where it was targeted, we will see improvement in these services. Right. So ours, our duty as Nigerian is to appraise government statements vis-a-vis -vis what we are seeing, vis-a-vis -vis empirical evidence. All right. And if empirical evidence does not suggest that our lives are better this year than they were last year, it then means that the 2021 budget is not doing its work. Oh, all That's right. all I can say about that. So, Seneni, can, can we still salvage, you know, the Nigerian situation? Is it still possible that we can fix uh, uh, this, the current government in power, and, of course, um, change our ratings? If there's going to be a Chandler government index uh, rating, um, maybe in 2023 or 2024, is there still a possibility that we can move higher up on that rating? Mauritius currently is the highest uh, country in Africa, African country, rather, in the rating. Um, is there still a possibility that that can be done? And what you know steps do you would you say should be taken? Let me get, let me just jump in quickly. I, I think unfortunately nothing will be done because we are firmly in campaign season now, and maybe that's the problem we have with this four-year election cycle. You only really have two years to govern, and then the remaining two years is is is, is wasted in campaigning. Um, and the problem is, is because of the nature of and the seriousness of the, the, the challenges we are facing, I, I truly worry whether we might even be able to have 2023 elections if insecurity and economic deprivation continues at pace. So I would again urge all government actors in government and even opposition politicians to set politics aside and just focus on fixing Nigeria. Um, if we course correct in two years, that will happen. But I don't believe it will happen. Um, I don't know if you recall recently when Lagos passed a law mandating um, Lagos State Courts to take over anti-corruption cases. And the signal this sent out was that they were doing it because certain actors in Lagos were being prosecuted by the federal. We cannot be playing politics with basic government, with basic rule of law, with basic economics. We, we cannot afford to. And I truly hope that the government sits down and looks at this report and uses it to course correct. It's interesting to note that corruption was, was signaled as the largest indicator of failed governance. Mm -hmm. And we are right at the bottom. You know, we, we all saw what happened in the NDC, NDC National Assembly probe. Yes. Where billions of naira were stolen, and when these people were brought to account, they started fainting on national television. Yet nobody has been arrested, nobody has been charged to court, the whole matter has been swept under the table. So why are we surprised we are at the bottom at any good governance index? Like uh, Nick said, we, empirical evidence suggests that we deserve to be where we are, mm -hmm. and we really need to start fixing these fundamental problems before the nation collapses around our heads. Nick, Nick, Nick let's go back to Nick. Uh, we're two years uh, from the elections, just like Jose has uh, mentioned. Nigerians are going to be seeing new political actors, or uh, maybe the same faces, uh, coming to vie for uh, positions. What are the things that you think you know, should be axed off uh, these persons if we need to in any way move higher up on, on the, this ranking? Nigerians... For since, since the advent of this current democratic dispensation in 1999, we have uh, voted people into office based on maybe they brought bags of rice to us and cubes of Maggi, or the person is from my village or is from my state or is from my geographic uh, 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 location, or he speaks the same language with me. 
And it has failed us. From 1999 to date, we have elected people who, instead of delivering good governance to us, have focused on self enrichment and other agenda that they have. For 2023, Nigerians, first and foremost, must elect leaders who have a pedigree of community service. If someone has never been part of the community, never cared about what the community is going through, and only showed up when it is election time, you should know that that man is a businessman. He just came to buy your votes. He has no interest in serving you. We have people who have been within with the communities, who, who have stood with the communities, not for any personal gain. People who have used their own resources to make communities better. We know them. You know, these are the people we should bring into office. If people don't have compassion over the sufferings of the people and you give them political office, there's no way they can't give what they don't have. But if we have people who ordinarily are not even interested in power, their job is more or less like charity. They have always been there. That is the first thing. We must look at candidates. We don't even have to look at political parties. We must appraise each candidate by his or her own merit. The second thing is that there is general empathy amongst Nigerians when it comes to the electoral process. The presidential election of 2019 had maybe probably there were uh, 30 million votes. 30 million votes out of 200 million Nigerians gave us this government that we have now. Other Nigerians sat at home and they were expecting other people to go and vote for them. Every Nigerian must take part in the political process. We cannot be sitting in the sitting room and saying that the kitchen is dirty and we are expecting clean food to come from that kitchen for us to eat. So Nigerians are saying the politics is a dirty game. You know, they, they don't want to associate. We feel good by saying we don't do politics. That has to stop. Everybody, every Nigerian of voting age must get their PVCs. The, uh, the, the PVC registration or renewal process is going to begin in June, as advertised by INEC. We must get our PVCs. That is the first level of participation. And then we must go out and vote. And then when we go out to vote, we must defend our vote. Don't collect 500 Naira and say your vote. You will suffer in the next four years. So we must sensitize our people. The middle class of Nigerians, that is those who are well-educated, working in, in good uh, companies, living in uh, estates, they leave this political space for the lower class. We must come out from our beautiful estates. We must descend from our high-rise buildings and be part of the political process. It is upon us to educate our people and tell them that they must be part of the political process. Okay. So carrying our PVC should be a thing of pride. A thing of, if somebody does not have a PVC, he should be looked upon as a societal reject. All right. It's uh, the Mr. only way we can arrest the decline. Mr. Ajili, and I, move forward. I have a question for you and uh, um, Mr. Aneni quickly. Looking at this global government index, they mentioned economy as one of you know the key indices that they used to you know rate these countries, and they mentioned that the countries that scored really high, you know, they had great market economies, and you see here in Nigeria, lots of entrepreneurs, you know, but they complain about the ease of doing business. Even just to register your business is a problem. To get your NAVDAC registration number is a problem. Just lots of challenges. So. Going forward, you know, you know, in the light of what we've been discussing for the next elections and the next government we're about to, you know, have, what should they do to make our, you know, marketplace more attractive? Ms. Ajale, first. The, 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 the government, the, the, the government, President Buhari only needs to have one agenda. And that agenda is law enforcement. Nigeria has a lot of laws. Okay, while, while we're struggling to get Ms. Sajale, um, Oseanene, are you there? I'm here. All right, please let us know your thoughts on this matter. Uh, I think um, 
the Malawi government, you know, should reduce the temptation that the, the, this current government fell into in, in 2015. When you sort of pick just one or two uh, issues and, and build a campaign around. I think Nigeria is such a diverse country uh, with such a diversity of problems. Now, what we need is not one candidate to come in and fix the economy or one candidate to come in and fix the security. But a candidate who can bring together, if he doesn't have the aptitude himself, a collection of, of leaders that can address all of the problems in Nigeria with at the same time. Um, speaking to this government, they, you know, you, you have this sort of um, dichotomy or this tension where I will admit that Professor Simba Jo has, has pushed for the ease of doing business reforms. Um, but then you have other arms of government, for instance, like um, at the presidency, where they are shutting down cross-border trade or the central bank is banning um, items on the import list and only giving licenses to billionaires. This, this type of dissonance, you know, scares investors away. Um, and if this government were to, to, to address, you know, the fact that we have um, almost 50% of our youth, youth uh, unemployed and we have double digit inflation, if they were to address this problem, it would be to address it in one voice and not have different arms pulling in, in different directions. So the 2023 election, what I would say is I think the legacy city government has left to be the most a free and fair election. And that would have to be anchored on electoral reforms. Okay. Um, right. I don't, just looking at the body language of the presidency and the National Assembly, I don't think we will have truly widespread electoral reform, but we don't need truly widespread electoral reform. It can be incremental progress, and that would be better. If the electoral process in 2023 is better than 2019, that's good enough. And then right. the next government can build on whatever um, progress this government manages to, to leave us with. Right. But I, I want to do a call to media. You guys do have a role to play in coming campaigns and elections. Um, the media cannot, I think, afford to sit on the fence um, because you, you are also stakeholders in the Nigerian project. So I would love to see more, the media take a more active role in amplifying the flaws and abilities of candidates so Nigerians are not deceived by partisan propaganda. All right. Jose Anani, thank you so much for your time. Uh, thanks for speaking with us. Nika Gule. Um, also, thank you for joining us this morning. We apology, uh, apologize for the poor network uh, quality, uh, most of the interview. Thank you very much uh, for yes, sharing with us this morning. Thank you very much. It's a pleasure. Yes, have yes. a great day. You too. All right. Uh, so the electricity debate, that's another area that we can discuss Indeed. at another time. Yes. Absolutely. We, we can't wait to talk about that in the nearest future. So we'll take a break here and return to discuss the World Day for Workplace Health and safety right after this.